Uh, my colleagues already should have told you that, but it's always better to insist on this. It's, uh, we, we don't bring fragmentation. I mean, there were, when uh, first Integrum grid devices came on the market in 2012, uh, we, we know there was something already there called uh, Android on ARM. With, I mean, every devices, every Android devices were working on ARM. Every applications were made for ARM. So, what we did is for all the Android Dalvik applications, so all these apps that use only Java, so use the Dalvik virtual machine on Android, it just works. It's uh, what beautiful with virtual machine is we can optimize the virtual machine and abstract the platform on the internet. And for the other application that use uh, shell libraries, so native libraries designed for specific CPUs, we made something called uh, NDK Apps Bridging Technology that allows our x86 platform to run ARM code directly without any recompilation. So when I say directly, it's still with uh, some, um, some um, binary translation uh, during runtime. But uh, it's working really well, and uh, it's working so well, we can say all devices are compatible with ARM applications. Most of the time, it just works. And otherwise, you can generate Android x86 libraries using the NDK that you would use it for any ARM libraries since a long time. You can use uh, the Android NDK to produce x86 libraries since already 2011, even before we had any platform on the market. So we are working with Google to, for this and uh, ready to, to make it easy for you developers and also for consumers. So first, yeah, let's talk about Dalvik app, NDK apps, so maybe not all of you already know what's an NDK app, and maybe we have different definitions. Our definition is NDK app is an application that contains and uses shared object libraries. So .so libraries that you can usually find in libs and a name, a directory named after the CPU ID app. So that's not necessarily because you're writing C, C++ and compiling everything yourself that you have an NDK app. If you're using uh, some game engines uh, like Unity or any of these, uh, in the end, your app is an NDK app. And most of game engines are using native <coughs> libraries. So what if you already have an application and only ARM um, shared object libraries inside? Of course, it's sad, but we have solutions. So, Everything starts there. When you use the NDK2 chain, so you have some make files, what you need to do is to inside JNI application.nk, so the application make file, you need to set app ABI to all. You can also set app ABI to x86 or ARM ABI or anything, but all, I think that's the most useful case. So if you put this variable to all and you run again in cables, and if the NDK2 chain will build your shared object libraries for all the available platforms from your NDK installation. So right now it would compile for RB7, RB5, MIPS, and x86. So everything starts from here. But so well, once you have your shared object libraries, all these are generated inside a libs folder and a folder named against your ABI. So I said six arm and so on. So it's all there in your Android package and your Android application folder. So when you package it, you have two solutions. By default, if you do it this way, it will just package all the libraries uh, along the rest of the application inside a big APK. Not necessarily that big, it depends on the size of your libraries. If you have uh, one more library per platform, it just enlarge your application size by the size of your current library, so it's not always that big. Usually, your code inside your application, that's not what takes the most place, that's uh, assets and some other things. So, that, that way is really the preferred way to go. And uh, if your APK starts to really be too big, you have the solution, you can build one APK per architecture, 
And when I say one HK per architecture, it's not one, uh, one application per architecture. That means that you go on the store, you still have one application. You still have your comments from user to only one application. Uh, they can run an x86 or ARM version of the APK, it's still one app. So for the standard way, that binary is the, the, way, the default way when, where you package all your libs inside your APK. You upload your APK in the store, like always, and when user browse the store and downloads your application, it downloads all of it. So it downloads also the libraries that are not useful for the user, for him. But it's only at the installation um, step that all the useless libraries are stripped out. And since the APK you send is encrypted and so on, there is no direct easy solution to just uh, avoid these multiple donors uh, right, uh, right away. So for the multiple APK one, it's um, it's both simple and complicated. I and mean, this store will think in a really simple way. It will not think, in fact. Okay. And uh, it's up to you to do a smart choice, just tuning your version code number inside your manifest. And uh, when you upload multiple APK for one application on the store, that means you will have several APK for the same app. And the user, when we, he will go on the store, he will just see one application, and when he click download, he will download only one APK. He will not choose himself. And so the store will deliver only one APK. And he will deliver this APK among the list of compatible APKs based on the higher version code number. Let's say you're uh, browsing a Play Store with one of our x86 devices. These devices will tell to the store, I accept x86 APKs, I accept RMB7 APKs, I accept RMB5 APKs, because I'm compatible. So the store is, uh, will filter out the list of compatible APKs, but you will just have nothing to filter, since everything is compatible. So to choose the only single APK to deliver, the store will deliver the one with the higher version code. That means the x86 one of your APK need to have the higher version code. Otherwise, the x86 the x86 devices will get the ARM version. That would be really dumb if you have the x86 version. It would be really sad. So here's a convention you can use uh, to um, rewrite your version code. Because version code usually, let's say you have uh, application version 3.10 uh, as human readable version. Uh, in this case, your version code number will be usually 310. So the clean way, in my view, is uh, if you have just one APK per, per architecture, you can just prefix your current version number, so you're still with an application 3.10, just prefix it with a 2 for RB5, a 5 for RB7, anything lower than the <coughs> one you will choose for x86. So here you can rename it to 6 and 310 as version number, version code. And here everything will work. Yes? Do you, is this also true on? Um, do you know which other the other stores, say the Amazon store, um, do things work the same way? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since uh, if you look at the device itself and you uh, run get prop on it, you will see uh, if you filter out the CPU part, you will see it works it supports x86 code and ARMv5 code. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it behaves the same, especially because if you uh, just forget the store and install the APK when you run NDB install. It will install only an APK with an IR version code. Sure. So it doesn't accept downgrade at all. So it should be exactly the same behavior. But I don't know if you can upload my type of APK on the Amazon store. Yeah, but for, I have no idea. It, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. So, when you're on your developer console, if you want to upload multiple APKs for your same app, it's not really clear uh, how to do that. Um, but let me say, uh, what is the way? You need to switch from simple mode to advanced mode. And then to just upload your new APK with different architecture support and different version code. 
And you may, the first time you do this, you may have the feeling you're overwriting your formal APK uh, along your, the whole procedure. But you will have some screens like this saying you're just striking ARM from your app and so things like that. In fact, no. It will just upload it along the other one, and you end up on this kind of console where you have one line per APK, the native support, and the version code. So you can check right away if x86.1 is the higher one. And then um, you can't switch to simple mode uh, anymore. If you try to, you just will have uh, an error message. So that's safe. But putting app ADI all inside your uh, application, your native code, and recompiling it, that's really simple. If uh, your whole source code and all your libraries belong to you, and you know that. So. But sometimes, um, most of the time, you're also using third party libraries or game engines you don't control yourself. I listed supports from various libraries and game engines regarding x86. These are, I think, the most used. Uh, by Android developers. And so if you look, most of these just have x86 support uh, already there. Uh, some of these don't uh, directly provide x86 libraries or x86 compatibility. For example, the JDX, that's a game engine we use from Java, but that's a native library in the end. It gives the x86 library only if you get the 90 bucks. If you get the st stable release, you only have the other uh, SOs for the other ADIs. But then to make it work, it's just a matter of going to the 90s, getting the JDX.SO for x86, and putting it inside your lib under the x86 folder inside libs. So that's not really a big deal for a developer to do that to get x86 support. For other engines, um, usually app API will be enough. And, and but some of uh, some other engines uh, still don't support x86. In this case, there is not much thing you can do yourself about asking them, begging them for x86 support, saying, "Hello, oh, we have devices now." But uh, uh, there is nothing you can really do. So Corona and Unity don't support x86 well, uh, yet. But the ARM version is working quite well on our devices. And if you buy an, an Intel device, you can still play it on the run. Don't worry. It's, uh, there is still a performance hit because of uh, the ARM emulation, but that's not that big. So even if you look at K900, uh, in Asia, it's, it comes preloaded with an application <coughs> that's uh, need for speed. And this application that's only an ARM application, there is no x86 binary inside. But they preload it on, on the device and think it's a value added for consumer. And as consumer, you can't even know if it's running for uh, some compatibility layer. So, yes. Um, the, uh, the TDX just released a 9.9 release and it has um, it's tables. It's it tables. has x86 in the stable. Right. <laughs> but you still have to add it manually. <laughs> You still have to add the SO file. Yeah, but if you have the old but it's, in the X, it's already in, in there. So, and if you encounter, I haven't listed all the libraries in the world. <coughs> you don't, it's not possible, but if you encounter a library that's not very really well known and that doesn't say explicitly it supports x86, but you have a source code of it, since it's open source. Usually, uh, it's not a big deal to make it work for x86. Um, because if you look at open source libraries on Android, native libraries, you, most of the time, these libraries haven't been created for Android. They existed before. And before Android, this part still exists, but before Android, it was mostly for Linux. Uh, and Linux on what platform? x86. So most of the time, if you look at an Android library, an Android native library, all the code is there for it to work well on x86. And if it doesn't work straight, that's because someone, when he ported it to Android, 
just messed up the compilation chain, hard coded many ARM uh, uh, macros and things like that, and that's just a matter of debugging the Mac file. So there is no assembly to rewrite or uh, things like that. That would take more, more time or knowledge. And usually in 10, 10 minutes, one hour, you can just fix the port of the Android library and make it compile for all the for all the ideas, including x86. And most of the time, to fix uh, the main file, you can rely on target arc ADI. That's uh, a macro set by the NDK toolchain. And when it's compiling for x86, target arc ADI will be x86. So you can just specify different uh, file inclusions. So includes C source code inside of ARM assembly source code that will not compile for x86 and that's something weird and uh, fix other macros. To spend this one last minute before x3, something useful. <laughs> Let's show you here one device and so you run an initial and get properties and you get the product information on the CPU you can see ADI1 x86 ADI2 ARMY ADI V7 but query show our device on the just as the library is on ARM so that means that every SL uh, library if you compile it for ARM is running also on the CPU almost yeah there is always some cases where it crash. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, most of the time it's working. Okay. And this is the C++ uh, compiler for, man, for Mitchell. For Android, also working for on ARM CPUs, or just on x86? The Intel compiler? Yes. Uh, Intel compiler just compiles for x86. Okay. For overall, you can use GCC. Okay. And um, just to sum up the last part that I presented, just let me show the reality or you just for example from the NDK. So <coughs> let's go inside the NDK sample. It's been all the last few. Okay. So if you go inside the samples, you have some applications uh, that are using the NDK. So we're inside and you run an NDK bot on Windows Inside NDK bot or CMD. Again, it's compiling for ARM ABI and generating the SO inside this uh, ARM ABI. And that's sad because that means by that by default. NDK to chain will compile only for R. So we just need to add app API in our role, equal all. <coughs> And you can see now it's combined for MV7, MIPS, and X86 as well. X86. <coughs> so that was just to sum up the last part because I already said all this. Any questions? Okay. So let's go back to the slides. And what is if you have? Code that write can't compile for x86, uh, or code that will write on x86, but it's working well now. Sometimes it can happen. So I have this input is right. Two cases. And these cases are not really that common, but sometimes let's go to this case. So first is uh, if you have written some uh, ARM specific code. So uh, for example, on ARM. You can use the Neon instruction set and uh, use the Neon intrinsics. So when you use this, you're writing ARM specific code that will not compile for x86. So you need to have different code path for x86. We have an equivalent uh, to uh, Neon instructions on x86, 
and uh, that's called the SSC. So on uh, these cover traces devices, that's triple SC3 that uh, is available. And all, all Android uh, x86 devices, you have at least triple SC3 available. Because if you compare on ARM, uh, Neon instructions are not available on ARM, are not, not available on all ARMv7 devices and not available at all on ARMv5 devices. And if you have written these Neon uh, instructions in your code, we are providing a header, a C header, that is wrapping all the Neon intrinsics, and there is like uh, 1700 of them. Uh, it's wrapping all of these to equivalent SSC code. So just using simple macros like this one. So uh, in 90% of the case, you have one one mapping, so you just include the header, and uh, you have as much as performance as you have, you have, you have written SSC free code in the first place. That's quite good. And in 5 or 10% of the uh, other cases, where it's not a one one mapping, it's still working but you can just have some performance hits because it's not a strict mapping. So there is some software emulation. Uh, <coughs> several intrinsics used instead of just one. So another case uh, that can uh, cause troubles during runtime is about memory alignment differences. So ARM platform are uh, double engine, and uh, on Android by default it's little engine like x86, so you're basically, in general, no problem with this. But you have some differences on memory alignment uh, by itself when it's packing or not packing structures. So if you look at this example of C structure with an int, long long and an int, on uh, ARM, the long long will want to be aligned on 8 bytes. That means if we produce this pattern, <coughs> and so with uh, four bytes for nothing, four bytes of nothing, eight bytes for the long long, and four bytes again, and four bytes again for nothing. And on x86, the long long will just want to be aligned on four bytes. That means memory structure will be packed, so we we'll, you will not have the, these white spaces here. So if it's this structure is just used inside your code and you compile everything uh, for x86, it just causes no problem. It causes problem if you are communicating with a server that will deliver data using this pattern or instead of this one. Or if you are loading uh, binary files, for example, if you store all the assets and information of your game and you load and you use the same files for both platforms and at load time, you're loading this pattern, but on x 6 it will be this one, so you will have any troubles on this. So there is a simple fix for this case, and that's a bit of a common case, because usually it's exactly the same behavior. So that easy fix here is to force the long long attribute here to be aligned on 8 bytes. And then you get absolutely the same memory pattern between x 6 and R. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Um, if you want a quick fix, you can also forget this and don't even touch your code, but pass the mlign double as C flag to be compiled. So it will align the double on uh, yeah, in this long on 8 bytes. But uh, you may encounter over issues when using over third party libraries or even the standard C library, it depends. So, really, the best safe way is to explicitly set this in the field. <laughs> and these are really two kind of issues when you turn and memory alignment issues not that common, but when it happens you you will be happy to have seen this slide before because debugging this kind of stuff is very painful. So now you have code that's running well that is compiling for x86 and running, you can go further and optimize it a little bit. So as we said before about Neon instructions, you can directly use SSE on our platforms. So current platform is triple SC3, next platform is SSC 4.2. So you can write yourself uh, 
SSC code uh, using SSC in print 6. Uh, but only if you really want to, because most of the time you can rely on compiler auto vectorization. Oh, by the way, vectorization, that's instructions that uh, makes you capable of executing the same operation on several parts of a data set in a restricted set of CPU cycles. So it just gives you more performance because you can uh, process more data in the same CPU cycle. <coughs> so, to, <coughs> so compiler can uh, many times do auto vectorization. So if you have a for loop that process data and uh, compiler can see there is no real dependency between this data among the loop, inside the loop, it can go and auto vectorize them. So to enable all this stuff, you can add C flags to the compiler, to the GCC here. So once again you use target arc ABI and you check it's x86, otherwise because you don't want to pass x86 specific C flags to your compiler when you're compiling for ARM. So you pass Hopefully and fast math, these two are close platform, but that just brings more performance. So hopefully just activate all the performance uh, option of the compiler, fast math to say you can add, accept uh, a bit less uh, exactitude in math. Most of the time it's okay to activate it. And the x86 specific part is after, so mtune equal atom to specify your compiling for the atom architecture on these devices. So uh, these are some specifics about this ar architecture. It's in order and some other stuff. The compiler no, you don't want to, you don't want to care about it. And activates SSC free. And also specify the uh, math library inside the compiler can rely on SSC. Because by default uh, math will be done using uh, x x seven instruction sets. So uh, a subset of x86 uh, dedicated to math, but SSC is a lot faster. But by default, it's uh, x87 because SSC is not available on all platforms. But here on Android, all Intel platforms have SSC, so you're safe to use it. And last time I used it on an application, uh, it was uh, some sort of emulator, I get 20% more, more performance. So that's not a little bit. If you want to optimize for our next architecture, you can uh, already use Entune SLM. So SLM is Silverhand, and that's the name of our next microarchitecture. That will be inside tablets and phones on Intel next year. You can use it. It's available with uh, latest release of NDK, RM9, and using GCC 4.8. You just need to also specify you want to use GCC 4.8 using NDK toolchain version. Because by default, right now it's 4.6. Mtune SLM and uh, SSC 4.2, so you can activate. If you're using Mtune, it will generate code that will also run on uh, older platforms. What about CLang? What's the compatibility? CLang, yeah, it's working. It's working? Yeah. But uh, not for. It doesn't accept the silver ones. Okay, but not for the silver one. Yeah. Okay. I can already use it for a chat seat in general. Okay. So, if you still have some bugs uh, running the right chat seat code, uh, here are some techniques for debugging uh, NDK code. So you may already know this, but uh, if you're trying to port a library you haven't developed yourself, then it's the first time you're touching the NDK, maybe it's just good for you. So most of the time, Inside the NDK, you can, the most simple thing is first to output stuff on the logcat. So we have an API for this, Android log prints. And the easier way to use it is by defining this kind of macros. And then in your code, call this like you would call printf. And then inside your logcat, you can see what you want to debug. Here, that's, yeah. Text debugging. If you want to go further with GDB and all this, it's also possible. Uh, first, you can also get more information about the load of your uh, shared object library. So you just call uh, setprop debug checkgi and one, 
and it will generate more information than a lot of shadow based libraries. It's already enabled by default in the emulator, and you can enable also it also on your uh, devices. About memory information, if you want to debug uh, Linux and uh, uh, memory overruns, so that will help you detect some uh, memory structure issue, issues like we saw before. You can use libc debug malloc, you can set it to 1 or 10 like on Linux, but on, you can call this only if you are root. And once you activate this, you need to relaunch uh, the uh, dynamic, so the whole Android environment uh, using ADB shell uh, stop and start. And for TV and Eclipse, so <coughs> Eclipse uh, is already able to use GDB with Android applications over ADB. Uh, some things to know is <coughs> so if your Android application has the debuggable flag uh, set to true inside the manifest, any cables will be called with NDK debug debug uh, equal one. So it will generate all the GDB files and your uh, library in the debug version. But uh, most of the time right now, inside your manifest, you don't set yourself the debuggable flag to true or false. It's uh, the ID who sets it uh, himself when to a debug mode or a VS mode. But in these cases, uh, if you're putting debug mode from your ID and you don't, so you don't have the true set the debuggable flag at true in your manifest, it will not set this. It's a bug. It will not uh, set any K debug to one. And uh, to be sure it's uh, working or no, you will see a different output from uh, any K debug. So here it's, uh, it's called with NDK uh, debug set to 1 because the, 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 uh, the debuggable, flag, debuggable flag is set to true in the manifest. So you can see some files are generated, GDB server and gdb.setup. So you're sure you're doing a debug. And uh, when <coughs> your uh, GDB server and all these stuff uh, are generated, to debug your Android app, finally, you can go to your app and select debug as an Android native application. And it will uh, launch GDB uh, viewing exits, uh, and you will be able to debug it as any application running on your own Linux desktop. You can you have breakpoints, you have all this stuff that's marvelous, but <laughs> um, your application will run before the debugger is attached. It will be launched before the debugger is attached, then it means that if you set a breakpoint during the load of the library, it will never be, uh, your, your execution will not, be, will not stop there, because the application doesn't know yet there is a breakpoint at this so you, you can put some timers and cheat a bit. But otherwise, that is pretty cool to achieve your own attack. So if GDB and all this is not enough for you and you like big, big weapons, for it's Valbrine. So uh, go ahead with Valbrine if you already know it. I think that's a good advice to give. If you know Valbrine, so that's a tools tool that uh, does many checks on memory, so able to de help you detect uh, memory leaks, memory overruns, and uh, and many more, if you know the options. It's working on Linux, so, but it's also working on, on Android. So, standard stuff on the background, so it gives you the error uh, when it's writing words. And background on Android is working as well. So when you get background, you don't have uh, directly the 
stuff to install, so I, I've made the package, uh, this package myself, you can get it. Using it to just push all that's in the package on your, uh, preferably the Android emulator, it's working well. The Android x86 emulator, you have just permissions, because uh, I made this zip on Windows, so it's all screwed up. But uh, it's a big deal. And then you set up that run to be pulled uh, during launch of this application using setprop wrap dot the package name of your app. And then next step to top of your app, you will be able to see all the background output inside Lovecat. So I made these binaries uh, for the 4.0 from pre <coughs> oh. <laughs> for the uh, four version of uh, Android uh, emulator, the x86 image. Uh, the 4.3 bug was uh, broken, so I couldn't uh, make it work. The emulator. You can also use it on real devices. Uh, in the package, uh, I've listed down the, uh, the steps you need to recompile it locally. And you can recompile for uh, Android 4 emulator. You can recompile it for real device. Okay. But here, I'm with what? It's a, it's a little bit touchy because of all these uh, many configurations. So, sorry. Any question on the rigging, bug line, block cat? So, we have uh, some tools um, to help you uh, proper apps and uh, improve. So, first, the Android x 86 image for the emulator, that's the most important thing. Uh, uh, who is using the Android emulator right now? So you're using the x86 one? Yeah, because your one is just painful. Uh, most of the developers I know and I, I ask uh, if they use the Android emulator, I said no, it's so slow. That's true, because by default it's using the ARM image and uh, emulating the old ARM platform using Dream. And that's really painful. Mm -hmm. The right way to use the Android emulator, in my view, <laughs> is to get an x86 image or whatever platform you want, and also install Intel Hardware Accelerated Execution Manager, Intel Accent. So that item is at the bottom of the list in Android SDK Manager. That's, uh, that's the most important thing. One small trick is the SDK Manager will just download the package and will not install it. Excuse me. Yes. When is there going to be Linux support? You don't need Linux support. You have KVM kernel module inside Linux, so you don't need Haxam at all. Okay. So so you uh, should be at it should it should work with the x86 image? Yeah, if it's still slow, you may need to add a minus KVM option to the KVM command line. You can find your way inside it with settings. Yeah, to uh, install the package for I think KVM. Uh, yeah, I already have KVM I yeah. Just to know I could use the x86 image. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It should work well. Okay. And yeah, so so the time on. <laughs> so if you're if you're just if you're Windows or a Mac, yeah, you need to use this one. Otherwise you don't need. And if you're Windows or Mac, it's the same, it will download the package inside uh, your SDK installation directory. Under Express Intel. And here is the package, and you just need to run the installer. That's a bit dumb to, uh, to have to do this, because uh, you may think, yeah, I installed it from, from SDK Manager, it should work, and then performance is even worse than the ARM one, and you say, what? <laughs> That's uh, usually So, to use uh, Intel Axon, you need to have um, uh, an Intel processor that supports VTX, so virtualization. Uh, extension. Yes, thank you. <laughs> virtualization extensions. And uh, usually, if your uh, computer is less than five or four years old, uh, it should have it. Uh, if the installer says it's not there, it's because it may have been disabled in, uh, in your BIOS. 
sometimes that it happens. So you need to go into your BIOS and just reactivate it. Yes. What's the time frame on like the nearest 4.4 having an at stage six? It's coming. <laughs> 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 just uh, yeah, we got these sources uh, not so long ago. So yeah, but <laughs> but uh, before point on the three, it went pretty fast. I remember. Cool. Like one or two weeks, so and it'll come up in that SDK. Yes, yeah, and it's a, it will appear before. So yeah, small benchmark comparing uh, the R simulator mm -hmm. and the X86 one. So yeah, since you can directly run through the GX on 186, that's a big difference. If you know entry to benchmark, a regular device will get like 12,000 or maybe 30,000 for the highest, uh, the most performing tablet. So you know, we're getting approximately the same performance than a real device. And on, on ARM, it's just unusual. That's already new. So, yeah, this tool is ready for any Android developer. We don't need to be a native developer to have interest in uh, an Android emulator that's working well. If you are doing native development, not necessarily only on x86, because uh, I mean, unless you're working for an OEM, you will not target only x86. <coughs> You have uh, some libraries made by Intel. So here is uh, Intel Folding Building Blocks, TBB. So that's a library for parallel programming. <coughs> that's a C++ library, at least. So right now, if you look at Android and uh, all these machines that comes with uh, four cores, soon eight cores, uh, present, in fact, many ways to do parallel programming uh, on Android. You have p uh, that's yeah, someone smiles. I guess no one wants to use bifreds <laughs> because that's when you need to <coughs> when you start using bifreds, you just time uh, yeah, you get more performance and more bugs at the same time. It's quite, it's quite complicated, so it's best to use more high-level libraries. And uh, TBB is still very really performant and. Other parallel libraries that exist are, for example, OpenMP, but uh, if you look into OpenMP, it's not available at all from any uh, compiler for Android. So in the end, you may uh, want OpenCL, but Google doesn't want to support it, and it's not on many platforms. And there is Render Script, Google is pushing. But Render Script right now, it's only on Android, and uh, it's working well, but for very specific cases like human image manipulations and things like that. TVB is uh, made for many more usages. So <coughs> first it's uh, open source, it's GPLv2 with runtime exceptions, and it's available on Linux, Windows, Mac, and Android. And it's also available uh, on ARM and x86 platforms. You can recompile it on ARM, it's working well. OpenCV, for example, uh, is using it by default. But proof it's working. If you want to pay, you can. Uh, <laughs> it will be the same source code, but uh, you will have different licensing. So you will be able to statically link it and things like that. And also get a, a bigger support from it. But the open source version is the same source code. So it's uh, up to you. So here is an example of uh, how to integrate Pi uh, so to get Pi. And uh, it's C++ with Lambda, so using TDB methods. Like here it's using parallel reduce. So parallel reduce will get us in inputs a range of operation. The function you want to be executed on each part of this range of operation. And also a method that will add results from these different loops together. Not necessarily add, it depends what you would want to do. Here you compare radius, you set the range, so 0 to 1 million here. You start with a 0 as a start of your radius, and you give this method to be executed on each part of the range. So it's one dimensional range, and you're just uh, adding the uh, area of the curve just to get by. And it's returning the local sun. And TBB will need to 
add together all of these local sums to get the global sum. So it will get this global sum using this reduction function. So it's just doing an addition, but you would be able to do anything. It depends on what algorithm you're working. So if you're not really into C++ or parallel programming, you might think it's complicated. But if you think about the p version, there is just no way it gets, uh, I mean, if very few, so we're not more simple, just think of the p version. Because if you want to reach the same level of performance with p I think to me that is one month and uh, a lot of code. And you will see that first. So, yeah, so my experience from using p is versus using the TV. But I'm sure you have the same kind of experience if you try it. So, yeah. any question on TBD? Yes? Uh, I think, uh, I hope, uh, is it included somewhere? Or? Ah, you can, um, there is no specific function for this, but you have many parallel algorithms that will be very suit this kind uh, of stuff. So you have the uh, concept of pipeline, so you can uh, just add, uh, add data when they are available and fill the pipeline and set limitations, so uh, it's quite complicated to just explain this like that, but uh, it should square to this kind of stuff, and especially uh, TBV is made in a way, uh, you don't need this method to have uh, um, a runtime you can determine. You, you don't need to have uh, methods that will at the same time on uh, each part of the range if the range is of the same size each time. And you can have uh, this part of the program can uh, run for an undetermined time. It will be still uh, fast. It will not lock all your execution. Your program will still do many other stuff if uh, there is some weight or anything here. So it's really, TBB is very suitable for this kind of, uh, of stuff with uh, async IOs or things like that because uh, it's, TBB is not really data oriented. It's not really a library where you just put a big image and want to work on big parts and you know exactly the time your program will spend on each part of the image. That's, uh, that's a lot more suited for what you're talking about. And if you want to go further, you even have a concept in TDB called flow graph. And you can just really, like you would design um, data dependency between, uh, between methods you want to execute inside your program. And really design it as a graph with dependency input outputs from anywhere. And it will just do it. <laughs> so that's really powerful. That's yeah, TBB is really a big topic. So if you want to talk more about it, you can. I like that idea So another nice tool we have is uh, Intel GPA. So if you're into some game, let me demo it. So GPA is a set of tools. Uh, you, you run a part of it on the, a Windows, Linux, or Mac. Uh, operating system, you run the system on either, and it will communicate over ADB to uh, uh, x86 tablet. Here it's only for x86 because you'll see it needs a, a tight integration with platforms, uh, GPU drivers, and GPU itself. Which is same booty. I can't demo it right that's, that, that's why it, that's a point. How many more? <laughs> Some more info on TBV, uh, on GPA. So GPA is doing real-time analysis of your application and the overall platform. So let's launch it. So it's running over ATV, so it should start to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You can see it. My device, my device is connected. So, I'm so 
here on it, so it's just listing the application I can analyze. So if my device were booted, I would be able to just analyze any application on the device. But here it's restricted to the application that has the debugger load flag set to true and the internet permission. So let's run, let's run the API demos. So I double click here and it's launching on my device with the debugger attached. So demo effect, you never know what can happen. So let's go into graphics and do some open gel rendering. Uh, we got some donuts, here is one. So you can see real-time analysis of the app. So uh, here you have target app CPU load. So that's not, uh, since I have launched the app, you can see the texture and line uh, went higher. That makes sense because there is texture maps on these donuts. And you can analyze many, many metrics. If you go on the left side, you can analyze frequency of all CPUs. The overall, the overall CPU load, uh, the CPU load from the app, uh, disk with and writes, network with and writes, and especially all the graphic pipeline from uh, the graphic drivers, OpenGL, to the GPU itself. So you can analyze texture loads, uh, shaders, electrician, uh, versus from OpenGL, you can get uh, draw codes, the number of draw codes. And in the overall system, you can also get uh, the uh, RAM used by your app and many things. And also, uh, current discharging rights. If you're using any over Wi Fi, because here it's with USB, so it's charging. So it's not discharging because of RAM. And even more interesting is uh, you can have all these metrics, and you can also do experimentations how this metric changes. If you, for example, let's say you switch to wireframe rendering. So here, if you look at your app, you can directly see if you have objects that are too complex to render. The mesh that is too big, and it's a big performance in for your app. But quite useful because I haven't done any instrumentation in API demos. I just took the uh, APK from the Google samples, and that's it. You can switch all the textures by a 2x2 two two texture. So if I disable it here, you should see the drop somewhere. Yes? So you're saying that if I had this with my my game, I wouldn't have to do, make any changes to the game, and I'd still be able yeah. to do a few wireframe mode and stuff. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, same for uh, Z test. There is not very much, but you can deactivate Z test and see if you are rendering objects and then rendering something on top of it. So just doing useless rendering. You can disable alpha blending, uh, but here there is no transparency involved, so it's just doing nothing. But you can do it. And you can also replace all the shaders by a very simple one. Here there are no shaders, sorry. It's not the right demo to choose. Here's the but, question. Uh, this simple shader is just replacing every pixel by a green one. So you can see if you have some. Yes? Uh, does uh, GPA also catch uh, logs uh, on the device? You mean logs in CPU execution or? Um, from the application. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, wait, Ops? Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, it does already use a lot of things, but uh, it doesn't monitor wait logs. Wait, logs rather than logs, right? Uh, yeah, uh, output. Uh, just like log uh, oh, commands. Oh, you can run log at side by side. Uh, there is also some instrumentation API, but I'm not sure it's available on Android. So, you would basically be able to send the. Uh, um, User metric from the map. So, can be pretty cool or something. I'm pretty sure it's available. But uh, it will appear only if uh, your app is sending the right. Let's go to GPA. 
and I think I have one last thing. Mm -hmm. Yes? There's a supporting open here, yes, free from low. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good question, but yes, uh, I think it's coming pretty soon. Okay. Uh, yeah, we first need to have open GIS with your Android X86 devices. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming soon as well. <laughs> Both will be together. <laughs> So yes, uh, I will not kill you with presenting many tools, so here are some of those. So Beacon Mountain, you may have heard the name, uh, in fact it's just a downloader and installer for all the tools I have presented, plus the regular IDT, Eclipse, uh, Android SDK, SDK. So that's just something you can use if you want to reinstall all your uh, dev environment for some time, it's a bit boring. Um, later it will be more, but right now that's it. So uh, it's the first step. We have the uh, Intel IPT preview, but IPT is something that already exists on desktop. Uh, that's something from Intel. That's a set of libraries that are really heavily optimized for uh, specific use cases like um, video transcoding, uh, image transcoding, encryption. Uh, this kind of usages, we, have, we can provide specific functions that are very optimized. We, we need to look, look into it, what's available or not. But uh, I don't present it extensively because it's only for x86. We need always to find our balance. So, uh, so cool. We have an Intel compiler, yes? Um, there's a uh, video decoding done in software on K900 or the special hardware chip for provided. It depends on the codecs you're using, but uh, most of the time it will be hardware decoded. Uh, I don't have a list in mind. Uh, Is it on chip? Uh, yes, yeah. we have a okay. on chip system. So the Intel compiler is something you can add to your Android NDK uh, and use instead of GCC. Uh, usually it's, uh, you can have pretty good performance gain on x86 platforms from 10 to 40 percent. Sometimes you don't get anything depending on your code, but uh, usually it's between 10 and 40 percent performance improvement. I don't present it because it's only for x86, but uh, today if you are already optimize your code too much and want to go further, you can try ICC to do it. Because right now it's free for Android. And it's uh, expensive on a lot of And uh, is the XTK news also interpreted before? <coughs> Project Anarchy. Uh, I, I need to say something about it because I love it. It's uh, a game engine. So who knows about it? Cool, thank you. So who knows about it? an Intel company. <laughs> no, <you're not>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we acquired about uh, one or two years ago and uh, we're working together and one of the things that came out uh, from not long ago, no. first, you, you didn't all knew about before, so it just means you said two words uh, about Avoc and the project. I'm oh, sorry again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the French company. Uh, I'm German, so I can't just say more. So, yeah, Adlock, uh it's not something really new. Uh, it's uh, from 1999. Uh, this time it was physics and that. That's a bigger uh, <coughs> asset. And then they added some other stuff for games animation. Uh, Giant Studio, uh, Close Simulation, Destruction Simulation, Artificial Intelligence, uh, Script Engine based uh, on uh, Lua, and uh, Vision. Vision is the URL free engine from uh, Havoc. And the, if you know Havoc, so uh, you know something you know it because you, you saw the logo at the boot of certain game, like, uh, let me find it. So if you don't know Havoc, maybe you know these games, uh, Assassin's Creed, 
and just free scaling Halo. So all these games are using the physics engine from Halo. And uh, over games are also using the workout, so for AI it does the building it. And Euro Scaling is also using animation studio and uh, so I think you get it. It's a logic tool but it's working well. The good news is if you want to do a mobile game on Android, iOS or Tizen, we give all this for free. And if it's not enough to get all this for free, uh, there is a contest and you can win $100,000. <laughs> 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 so, Just launch it. If you uh, get an um, and if you use an key for your game, uh, we will not not ask for any money. If, even if it's one million dollar with it, we will not ask for any money. Just you to keep this flash loader with the key logo. That's not a big deal. <laughs> if you do one million. But uh, let me show you some strength of uh, this and then. So. Okay. Just show you one of the samples of this game and then. RPG, so RPG is uh, one of the samples of the game engine. Uh, you have all the source code available and all the assets. You can reuse everything, all the, uh, all the characters, the assets, uh, the source code itself. I will show you one of the scenes of the project. It's the scene inside the temple, but you also have uh, outdoor scenes and uh, another one. I think I still have disabled the laptop in the end. Yeah, it's not abandoning, it's still deactivating because of the GPA. <laughs> That's fun. That's fun. <laughs> I think I will get killed by the time I. <laughs> This is the first time I can see it's persistent. <laughs> Price you need to send them an email. That's that type. 
and one some really cool feature is let me configure with Wi-Fi so it's it's connected so I can prepare the device so preparing the device you just write my IP address uh, somewhere in the device it's not a big deal but what it allows is for me to run a specific APK called this in the world I don't need to do it anymore
I remember the early days of the internet, it was faster than that. <laughs> but it seems to work every day though. So I think right now we can almost oh, okay. So we're to the contest with uh thousand one hundred thousand dollars win. I think now we can switch to the second part of uh, the day, uh, where you can try to get accessible support from your app. If you have any troubles, I'm right there, and here I'm ready to help uh, any of you to get your app uh, working with all XHCs and even optical further optimize it. So let's go. Uh, Monica, yeah. you need to rearrange the room. Yeah, but um, I'm letting you just continue in the LXC and the contest again. Okay. So I'm just going to explain how the all the contests will go. And if you have any questions when you are working for Alex, I'm right there. Okay, still okay guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah. <laughs>